just wondering if you guys can hear me now. I've had nothing but trouble with my sound. Okay. Um, I'm trying this. I'm muting my iPad now to see if that works. Um, okay, great. You can hear me because I'm hooked up, to, hooked up to my Yeti, which I can hear everything through fine, but um, unfortunately, it looks like it's a bust on that. So, no worry. I'm going to mute that so that there's no more issues. Unmute. Okay, let's see if that works. You can see me. That's good. Um, maybe that's it's like a silent movie. I'm hoping you guys can hear me now. Uh, let me know. And if not, I'm gonna have to go. Ah, see me? You hear me? That's a yes. Okay, perfect. Great. Finally, I have to run the sound through my iPad. It's just unbelievable how this is working. And now I'm going to leave for one second. The lady who cleans the hallways in our flat um, just decided to come by with her vacuum at this very minute. So anyhow, great, great that you can hear me. You, Sasha Baron, thanks for showing up. Angelica, thank you for showing up. Uh, so I've had nothing but trouble with my bloody sound, and I thought I had it perfectly before. Um, and maybe it was working perfectly before, but I, I unplugged some crazy thing. I don't know. It's just I recorded it, works fine, and then suddenly that's it. It's not going to work anymore. Um, anyhow. Thank you for showing. Uh, today is kind of a an interesting program. I want to show you something here. Uh, I'm going to go to my um, screen, and you'll see. Um, well, you'll see three things here. Hopefully, you can see the painting that started last week um, over on the left, a little wee one, um, and. I have this great big gray one in the middle here, and I want to talk about impressionist painting, how this works. Um, the one on the, the, the large screen, this one 
here um, is really not a typical approach to impressionist painting. Um, and the reason is that because um, there are a lot more darks in it than there would be typically in an impressionist painting. But I want to show you something interesting. Um, I'm going to show you what this looks like in full color. And you'll see how uh, if you get your values right, um, well, things disappear in black and white and gray, but they suddenly show up in color. So let's have a look at that. That's what that painting actually looks like in full color. It's just unbelievable. So you see all those flowers, those poppies in the foreground, all those reds, but black and white, they simply disappear because the values are all the same. So that's one of the most important things to think about when you're doing an impression. You really want to be able to uh, control your values so that, oh, not that well. <laughs> control your values. Oh, it's going crazy. Um, so that you have everything in the upper register. When I say that, lighter than a mill value, ideally. And so I'm going to, I'll take you to the screen and just talk about that a little bit. I'll come back to you, actually. Okay, so when painting, uh, typically we're trying to, you know, the tradition of painting, we're trying to get a full range of values. So we're trying to get, you know, a good, good rich darks and highlights that are really light and bright and so on. Um, and that's fine. Uh, that was, that's the tradition, you know, in the old school uh, ateliers, they were teaching us, they were, they were teaching them back then that they really needed to have a full range of values, as many as they could get. Some of the uh, classical schools will teach you that you should have a range of 12 uh, different values. And, you know, you work up a value scale in black and white. You can match all of the values of, of the thing that you're looking at to your value scale. When I talk about value, those of you who don't know um, and may be just checking in on this, uh, value means how dark something is to how light something is. So that's just a term that's used in painting. You could call it darkness and lightness if you wanted to. Um, uh, you know, really it's, it's whatever you want to call it. It's from dark to light and there's a range of shades, and when I say shades, of, you know, dark, to a little lighter, to a little lighter, to a little lighter, all the way up to white. So you've got black and white and everything in between. Just be careful with that. So when I talk about values, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, Stilio, nice to see you. Um, thanks for showing everyone uh, who is here. Um, so why is this so important for, um, for us to understand? Well, if you were looking at a John Singer Sargent painting, and take a photograph of a John Singer Sargent painting, you will see a full range of values, at least in his early work, in his very early work, uh, when he was younger. And um, he started to head more towards Impressionism as he got older. And the funny thing is that, um, actually, he and Monet were, were painting friends. Like, they painted a couple of times each other. Um, they knew each other. And um, there's a funny story about this because uh, apparently at one point, well, Monet was not a photographer, you know, and he, he really could create some amazing color. And um, Sargent thought, well, maybe I'll just borrow his palette. So he went over and asked Monet if he could use his palette because, you know, Monet's palette would be something special, I guess. And um, he went off and, you know, did a little bit of painting and came back fairly soon and kind of went back to Monet and said, uh, I can't paint with your palette. You don't have black on, on your palette. And um, it's kind of a funny story because, you know, I'm paraphrasing the whole story. But it's a funny story because you realize that uh, Sargent had become somewhat dependent on black, you know, especially in his early years, um, as a way of bringing them getting those dark that he wanted. Um, I'm, I, I'm guessing, I don't really know him 
and read up on it. But I'm guessing he probably used an ivory black, which has a lot of blue in it. It's a cool black, but don't quote on that. Um, those of you who are sergeant specialists will know. Um, and uh, of course, if you have very dark colors, or you know, on your palette, you can get a really great range of, of, of values from dark to light. So the impressionist figured out, uh, and especially when I look at his work, you don't actually have to have really dark values to make your uh, your painting look like there's a lot of light and a lot of value change in it. You play with color, and the colors that you're playing with are um, intense colors, the pure pigments, of course, um, and uh, pure pigments. You can lighten everything to a value that is above a middle gray. Um, and maybe put in an accent that's a little darker if you want to. Monet, Monet did this regularly. Um, he painted in the upper register. So if you can imagine like a piano keyboard, uh, he was playing in the top end of the piano keyboard. Um, he did that, it was backwards. So maybe I should do this. He was playing in the top end of the peak, uh, keyboard. So <clears throat> those really dark notes, um, it's not, uh, uh, they weren't, um, they weren't so much in, in his uh, paintings. Uh, thanks. Yeah, my sound's breaking a bit now and then. Uh, it's just sort of brutal. Um, I'm doing this through my iPad. I'm going to try something. I'm going to and I'm going to unmute my phone and let's see if that's actually better sound. So are you guinea pigs here? I really thought I had it worked out today. So here we go. I'm going to mute my iPad. Okay, I'm unmuting my phone. I'm hoping that that sounds better. Let let me know if that's working better. Um, and if it's not, I'm going to keep going because I'd have to break everything down to try and do it the way I used to. I've ordered like half a dozen different devices to try and sort this out. And um, I hook something up, something else doesn't work. So maybe I actually need a new computer. That's Mine is like 10 years old. So I've got other new stuff, but not a computer. I'm hoping that this is, that you're able to hear this okay. I know. Um, <clears throat> please. So... Um, one of the things that uh, Sergeant, of course, was amazing at was his value. So, uh, still a bit spotty. Thanks, Linda. I'll just keep going. Thanks. Um, if you take a black and white photograph of a John Singer Sergeant painting, um, it looks like a photograph. If you take a photograph, a black and white photograph of a painting, you lose a ton of information, just a ton of it. Um, and I'm going to go back to this just again. Um, just, you can see the difference between the black and white. And you can see how much is lost in the color um, because the values are so close, especially with the flowers in the foreground. And then what I do is I'm actually going to kick this device out because that's my computer that messes things up a bit here. So I'm just going to shut that down. You won't get to see this again. Maybe that's good. All right. Okay. So now we're down to what I want to do today. Um, I'm working from a photo. I can show you the photo. Um, what I did was I took it into a poster kind of app if you will i do like to do that sometimes and it sort of gives me a breakdown let me just go with this so you can see this took that away from the screen okay i want to make that solo layout there we go so you can see what i've done this is a photo that i took in a forest and I put it into a poster app, which just kind of pushes the colors. Um, kind of neat uh, to be able to do that. 
Um, I don't always do that, but sometimes it gives me good suggestions. So, um, and impression painting is a lot about color. It's not a perfect um, image to work from because there are some areas that are pretty dark. And I'm going to attempt to, um, to paint uh, the darks just with uh, changes of uh, chroma. So I'm going to try and keep everything if possible above the, the gray, uh, the middle gray. Maybe put in a couple of accents near the end if I really have to. So I get to this screen again and I'll show you what I've done. I'm working, unfortunately, my funny little face is up in the right hand corner here. So covering up the only color which you which is pretty easy to know, which is white. So I've got white up here. It's a um actually a, a permelba white. That's what it is. And then underneath that I've got a cadmium yellow medium. And under that I've got a cadmium red, and that's a, an old Holland, and I've got uh, ultramarine blue. So those three colors are the basis of all of these other colors here. Um, what I did was I took the, the cadmium red and I just mixed a, a pink. Now you'll notice that all of these colors are quite light. If I were to take a black and white photograph of, of this, all of these colors should be no darker than the gray that you see here. This is a middle gray. If you look to the left over here, my middle gray is going to be somewhat in this range here, or maybe even there. It could be a touch lighter. This, by the way, is a little device that I like to use sometimes. If you've been following Stefan Nutzel, um, you, you know that he has one of these, and he likes to use this to get his grays. So when I put that over top of my grays, going through a little hole like that, you can identify um, how light or dark something is depending on where you hold this. So if I go over my, let's look for the, the darkest area, which might be sort of in this area right here. I'm going to try and see if I can line this up. This is a little tricky, but let's see if we can do it to that. And you can see it's roughly that gray, that middle gray. I don't really want to go much darker than that, but maybe there's one that's a touch darker there about there. Maybe it's a little lighter. So I'm really trying to keep my my values light. And if I were to take this and just fold it over, and, and I think I'll do that. Just a moment. Just folding this over here. And we can still see that it's kind of shiny. I'm getting a little reflected light. I don't have my professional camera crew here today. Uh, this is just me. <laughs> I'm a professional camera crew. And the sound manager, apparently. So, sound engineer. Okay. So, I'm going to attempt to keep my, my values light like this as I'm painting. And use the combination of colors that I have here. Um, I've taken my red, I've, I've gone from this middle pink all the way up to something very light. Uh, the blue, ultramarine blue, I started here. And um, again, middle gray. I've just added white into these. That's all I've done. And then I created a green, taking the yellow and the uh, uh, cad yellow and the ultramarine blue, created a green that's a middle value, and then added white to that. And this was going to be an orange. And when I mix it up, I realized it's actually fairly intense. And what you don't want to do is have some intense covers, just uh, colors, just taking over um, your your palette. If you have um, some harmonization of color, that really helps a lot. So what I did was I brought just a little bit of blue into these orange colors right here so that everything has some harmony. You know, they all are related to each other with the color um, blue. Now, red, it's a pink. I didn't put any blue into that, or that would have turned to violet. And maybe I'll need to mix some violet later. We'll see. If I need to do that, I will. 
<clears throat> hey, Ken, nice, nice to see you. Um, all right, hoping that the sound isn't just brutal. Um, this is recording. Um, and um, I know when it goes to YouTube, you can read it sometimes if it can understand me. Uh, sometimes it can't understand me. Uh, all right. So I've got the basics down here already. I painted into a green background that I've left over that I had, which is a, a green that's fairly close to the ones that I've mixed up here. Um, now what I want to do is start to bring a little bit of uh, texture and a little bit of detail in this. And I don't want to get too much detail going. Um, I want to keep what I would call broken color. So I'm, I'm going more for the feeling than I am for the edges, if that makes any sense at all. If I take my darkest colors and I start to mix them together, if I take my blue, for example, here, and I take my green, I end up with a blue-green. I'm just going to mix this in front of you. Um, and that, in theory, you know, if I take a little bit of the red here, that gives me um, a blue, a green, a red. It gives me a gray. And I'm going to just go into the background here with this color. This should be, in theory, some of the darkest color. Now, you see, um, as I drag my brush, I'm, I'm not putting any medium into this at all, by the way. I'm just working over broken color that's already on this board. And I want to keep that feeling as much as I can. That's uh, the impressionists were known for a broken color. This is just a bristle brush. Uh, it's an old one. I don't even know where I got from. The label's worn off. But anyhow, any old bristle brush will work. And I'm just going to paint in the darker negative shapes that I see here. Um, now, I'm just going to do something here. Uh, maybe this sound will be better. I just realized I've got the sound turned up a little bit on my iPad. Okay. Um, now, I just want to get these negative shapes working in the background. If I want, I can go back and while I'm doing this and bring other colors into that. So I'm just adding in little bits of the, the blue. Um, I can go into a red if I want to. And I can bring in a touch of red here. Um, as, long as, as long as I'm working in the same values, in theory, and again, in theory, this should work. Let's just do it well. So I'm just trying to get, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of working towards a finished look, like right off the top. I, I'm trying to think about leaving my brush strokes down as if it's going to be a finished piece. Um, I can always go back and visit it later, but it's really nice to be able to just put it down carefully, drawing as I go. When I first started this, uh, if you weren't watching last week's program, um, I actually created this using three brush brushes simultaneously with different uh, colors, uh, and that was interesting. I'm going to do something here. I'm going to take the light away from this a little. So maybe you can see this better. All right. Yeah, I like that better. <clears throat> Thanks, Julio. Sounds sounds better at the moment. That's good. I'm happy to hear that. Um, I really, honestly, I've got so many parcels that are going back because the equipment that I was getting was not working. It's really urging. Okay. This is also something to think about. Um, when you're doing a painting like this and you're working with a lot of different colors, it's often a good idea to have several brushes on the go to keep your colors fresh. You know, already I mixed one color into the other here. I don't have to do that. Um, I can try and keep my colors clean um, and pure. Um, and when I say pure, they're already pre-mixed. So, you know, there's a real advantage in pre-mixing your colors. I'm going to something a little bit lighter here. 
I want to put a tree in behind here. And I do like the way it breaks up on this board. I have an oil-based primer down here, which I've used before. Um, and I like it because you have, it's nice, it's nice uh, gesso to work over top of, especially if you're doing washes, and I'm not doing washes here. Um, in some cases, I've actually seen impressionist paintings where they've gone over areas with a glaze, which really is interesting because I don't, it has a different feeling to it, but it does enhance the color because you're working with pure color over top of um, a color that's underneath. You're looking through a color when it's a glaze. And a glaze is just basically taking a linseed oil or maybe liquid or something like that and painting over top of a color that's underneath. And you're looking through that pure color at the color underneath, which is really nice. So it just, um, as soon as you add white to a color, and all of these colors here have had white added to them, it lightens the color and it cools the color simultaneously. That's what it does. So if you want to get a really pure color, and maybe I should show you an example of that. That might be interesting. Um, I'm just going to show you what that would look like. I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take an ultramarine blue, and I'm going to use a fresh brush to do this. And I'll show you what a glaze would look like over this. Andrew, nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Okay, I'm just going to take the ultramarine blue that I have here. And I'm, I've got a medium. I've got a combination of linseed oil and uh, a little bit of thinner. And this is another way that you can create kind of a a feeling, an impressionist feeling, if you want to get uh, some color underneath coming through. Um, and you can always take a glaze away. If you don't like it, you can actually get rid of uh, a glaze as well. So I'm just going to go over top of these colors that are underneath, and I'll do a larger area so that you get a sense of what that looks like. You get all those beautiful textures underneath. I know in the past I've shown you this technique of using uh, Q-tips, for example. I'll just take a Q-tip or two. And you can remove paint that you put down with a glaze like that. So this is another nice way of getting some, again, high can to get darker than my values here. And they're not. Those are not darker. But there's a sense of atmosphere and darkness and texture that's coming through from the background there. It's a very nice effect. I, I, I really like it because you're getting a fresh, clean color over top of colors that are more muted underneath. And that's a beautiful combination when it happens the right way. I'll do that over here too. I'm going to get rid of this little grayscale. Just pull that out of the way so it doesn't get in the way of the painting. The other thing that I like about glazing is that, you know, it doesn't have to be one color. I can bring in just the tiniest touch of cadmium here and turn this into a violet. Um, by the way, cadmium is not really a very transparent color typically, um, but you can still turn that into a glaze um, if you want to, if you get enough medium in it. Uh, right now, it's not making a beautiful violet, but it's giving me a sense of shade happening back here. And I'm just going to be using the reference that I have in front of me as a guide. I'm not absolutely, uh, I'm not following this reference as if it's, uh, you know, a, a religious book. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I'm just using it as a guide and making my own kind of scene out of this. You can, with a glaze, of course, you can turn it from violets into blues and so on and so forth. It's really a lot of fun. Now, one of the things when you do that, of course, if you're working with broken color, um, 
over top of dry color. As soon as you put a glaze down, it, it makes it wet. And you don't have, if I take a, try and create broken color over top of it now, you can do it somewhat, but it's not quite the same. It's not as subtle, or it's not as broken, I should say. If the, the texture underneath is, uh, I guess, has enough dimension to it or enough uh, roughness or texture to it, then, of course, pick up a few ridges. But what I like about glazing is that I can just take it off again. And when that's dry, then I can work my broken color over top of that. I'll just do that. And you can see the difference. If I work over a glaze versus working over something that is not glazed, you can really see the difference in that. <clears> the <throat> thing that you should have when you're working in the studio is long sleeves so you don't get paint all over yourself, which I just did. Anyhow, it's okay. I'm still learning how to do this online, so bear with me. I think I get better at it. I've um, been doing a lot of teaching online through the Avenue Road Art School, and that's really been great because it forces me to figure out some of the technology. But it's different than this particular program that I'm working through now, which is called StreamYard. Um, we usually do Zoom classes, and uh, it's a different program, and this one here is a little bit trickier, but I like the format of it. So. You get some good and some bad with every program out there, it seems. Um, all right. I'm going to go back into the background. Let's see if I can move this along. Um, I'm going to get some nice rigid darks up top here. In fact, they can, they can be a combination of the green and blue. I'm even going to bring a touch of red into it. Just after I think you should have a fresh brush for or a clean brush for every color you're using. I'm doing exactly the opposite. The rules are meant to be broken, so just you break them. Okay. Especially with painting. You know, you can, there's so many rules around painting that I hear, and I think, well, you know, yeah, okay, it's not a bad idea. It's pretty, it sounds okay. But then once you start painting a bunch, you start to realize, well, if I just do this thing, this little experiment, that might work better. And in fact, um, it's through those little experiments that you learn to grow as, a, as an artist. And you get more interest happening for you than it shows in your brushwork, it shows in your painting. So um, this is really an interesting little scene. There's lots of warm colors down in the foreground. And that's the other thing. When you're working on a painting like this, um, ideally you want to be working around the whole painting. As much as you're trying to put down brush strokes, um, at the same time you want to be thinking about other areas. The other tool I really love to use, as you know, as I keep using it, um, is the palette knife. So I'm going to put a little bit of palette knife work into here just to break up the textures, keep things working in this area. And again, it's a nice way to put broken color down. Um, just a combination of a couple of different reds here. Uh, the red, that's the other thing too. I like to work with the complement colors, especially in Impressionism because with an Impressionist painting, because it gives you this opportunity to play the opposite colors off of each other. It doesn't mean you can't bring you know, your complement colors in beside. Um, you can see what happens when I do this. I get the, a little touch of light that happened. I'm um, going to go into some of the blues. And in fact, what I'll do is I'm going to create a, a violet. I'm going to take this blue here, the darker blue and that red, put them together. And that's going to give me a violet. When you look at that, it practically disappears against that gray. See that? I know that it, that 
it's the right value. That's the dark value that I want to go at the moment. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to go to a dark accent later, but I'm really trying to do the painting as much as I can with nothing darker than this value here. So I've got a, a, a very gentle violet color that's happening right here. When I say gentle, you know, it's uh, it looks dark against the other colors because they're lighter. So I can make, and this is the neat thing, when you make it at a time, I can make a lighter violet just by picking up uh, the light blue and that pink and putting those two together. And I've got a very light violet now. And you can see how much lighter that is compared to this one over here. When I want to put some colors in, say, to the trees, if I want to pick up some of the, the cool violet lights that are hitting against these trees. I haven't used white at all yet, and I probably won't, um, because um, white usually doesn't appear in nature. It sounds kind of crazy. Even if you look at clouds, you'd think well, there's white clouds out there. But if you look at them very carefully, you'll find that the white clouds usually have a bit of warmth, or they're a little cool. They're not, you know, we don't really see white very much. It's We see it when it comes out of the paint tube. And it looks like it's white, but even that color that comes out of the paint tube is affected by the lighting in the room. So something to keep in mind when you're painting or sorry well yeah when you're painting and even out walking through nature these are things that you can look for i'm kind of just making up these trees as i go um just trying to get some background going here and i do love what happens um, with these random colors as you put them down. And the temperature changes, um, the subtle things that happen because there are other colors that are popping out from behind. Um, I love the effect. And over there, there was a bit of glaze. So you can see it didn't pick up all the textures. Textures tend to be more in the foreground, by the way and less in the background. When I say that, um, your values, and if we think about the values here, your values in the light, between the light and shade, uh, are usually closer together. Those values are closer to get between the light and the dark uh, in the distance than they are in the foreground. In the foreground, you have more contrast in the background, you have less contrast. Maybe that's just another way to say it. And so if that's the case, you will be thinking about if you're painting over a glaze like that, well, that's a way of softening your colors down a little. So there's a little less texture and a little less contrast and value. Again, I have no idea exactly where this tree is going. I'm just chunking things in because I also know that I can always take stuff out later if I want to. I just want to get a feeling of what might be going on back there. I can bring just a tiny bit of light into a tree just to pick up on an edge in there. If you resolve everything in a painting so everyone understands everything that they're looking at, then you don't keep audience. Um, it's like, okay, well, I know what that is. I don't need to know anymore because I know that that's exactly this bridge that connects to that one. And, you know, these leaves look right together. Um, if you give someone the whole story, there's no mystery to it. And this is something I know about a lot with my students. Um, leave symmetry, uh, leave areas that are unresolved uh, if you can, because then what you're doing is you're uh, you're 
allowing for the viewer to be diligent, they can figure it out, right? Like people know what they're looking at. We look at things our whole lives. We don't presume that people don't know what they're looking at. And you don't have to be like, you know, it maybe you want to show your skill. That's that's a whole different thing. Like if you want to well show how skillful, skillful you are at making things looking looking realistic, well, fair enough. Um, but if you want a painting that has some life to it, then you have to let your audience bring some of their life to it. And I'm a real believer in that. I think uh, some of the most beautiful drawings and paintings that I've ever, ever looked at, even even with someone like Sargent, like you, you think, well, they're highly realistic. But if you really look at them carefully, there are passages of paint that are very mysterious. When you get back, they look right. But when you're up close to it, um, you know, it's just, well, it's just a big blob of paint. It doesn't doesn't really make any sense until you see it in relationship to all these colors that are around it. So right now I'm still tr exploring and trying to find uh, trees that are that I think will look nice. I'm I'm not following my reference much anymore. Um, I'm just really trying to. I'm going to bring just a touch more intense red into a couple of areas. I have to be careful I don't get too dark here. I want to save some darks, maybe a couple of very dark spots for right near the end where I want to have some accents. Right now I just want to get a sense of some forest. Um, I'm going to bring some more pinks in because I, I really like the way those pinks are pushing the greens out here. And with these kind of paintings, you know, you, you can really you can play with these forever um, and just keep punching color in here and there, letting it evolve. Um, I think the subject is pretty easy, honestly. When I say easy, yeah, it's tough to paint a whole forest. But I've picked a subject that is very forgiving because, you know, we generally know what trees look like and it's not rocket science to do something like this. Um, if you're painting people, for example, that's pretty challenging. And I'm always impressed with uh, impressionists uh, because they could... You know, paint a whole garden party and kind of make that look right. So uh, that's something. Uh, and if you really look at what they've done, uh, painting those garden parties, uh, the people's faces and hands and the clothing they're wearing are just kind of blobs of paint. They don't really make a lot of sense until you get back from it. And I'm sure they spent an awful lot of time going back and putting little blobs in spots where they felt you know what, that just needs a little bit more information. It's so tempting for me to reach over into the darks because typically I paint more tonally. So impressionistically is, impressionistically is not my go-to way of painting, typically. So it's really a personal challenge to not reach into the darkest colors that I have and just punch some darks into the backgrounds, into these trees. So just holding back, really, and mixing ahead of time forces me to really think about um, putting in the essentials in value, keeping it very light. <clears throat> uh, I sort of want now, because I got so much of these green trees, I want to pull something light and, and clean out of these trees. One of these trees I feel in my references is fairly strong and it's quite light. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to bring in this very light color here. And that's the other thing I noticed about Monet's paintings, really seeing them. Um, he was not afraid to put lots of paint in, so don't be shy with your paint, that's for sure. Now that light's not going to look 
right until I get more darks up against it. So I have to do that to make that work. I'm going to just have that tree carry on up through here. These are definitely not Bob Ross happy trees. These are just sort of like, you know, way back in the woods. Way back in the woods and kind of old and gnarly and, you know, we've been here a long time and leave us alone kind of trees. I want to get these darks working here in behind the lights that I just did. So let's just do this. I should do a little bit of um, advertising here while I'm painting in front of you. At the moment, if you haven't, if you've been watching Facebook, um, I've posted a few things, but the um, Toronto Art Fair um, has already gone online. And when I say that, it's not like sort of the official opening, but you can look at artist works, including mine, of course. Um, I was very happy to be accepted by the jury into the show. Um, hadn't done it for a few years. I always did like doing it because um, you, you got to meet so many people. Well, this year, unfortunately, we don't get to meet so many people because of COVID. But um, there's, uh, there's like, I think, over 3,500 images online if you want to check it out. Um, and lots of really neat art to look at. And of course you can order it, it'll come right to your door. Um, it's not the same as being at the show, that's for sure. It's great to meet the artists, I think, when you can. Um, because then you sort of get to know them a little bit, and you know, it's a nicer connection. You get to talk about their work, uh, but they're doing what they can through this difficult time for everyone. Okay, feel like that color there needs to pick up somewhere else, maybe over here. And these are really subtle color changes. Like when I look at this, it's not, I'm not even following really a sense of light and shadow at this stage, um, which is curious. Uh, usually I like to really be thinking about where my lights and shadow are. And maybe I should be doing more of that, but right now I'm just trying to get some paint down in places to make this look like it has some interest. <clears throat> what I think I need to do at this stage is um, I'm going to try bringing the fork, this area uh, in some kind of harmony. I'm going to go into this dark red, pinky kind of color with a glaze and just see if I can pull some of that together. If I don't like what I do, I can just wipe it away, right? That's the nice thing. I'm just gonna just let people know this is the ground. It's the pink ground. It's like leaves have fallen or something. Pink and green are really fun colors to work with. Uh, they complement each other. They're opposite to each other on a color wheel. If you're looking at that. So complement colors can really bring in some beauty. They tease our eyes. Um, they vibrate with against each other, these colors. I'm gonna bring some gray areas in here. I like using this brush, by the way. It just kind of forces things to look fresh. I can't control the brush too much. I, it, it just picks up the textures and, you know, kind of puts down its own information. Getting, getting a sense of shadow when I do this, so I'm going to go with that. Um, bring some of these colors in here. 
also a, a soft brush like this helps to tie things together. Um, I have to watch areas like that that are that have a lot of contrast in the corner. Maybe they work, maybe not. Um, come back and look at that later. I want to define this area a little more. Have, having texture everywhere uh, is a little disconcerting sometimes. So, you know, this is a nice way of blending a little bit. Um, kind of like a, um, a symphony, you know. It's great to hear the sax of, well, maybe the, you can hear the tuba kind of in underneath everything, but the trump, all you heard was trumpets all the time. Um, it gets a little bit much. Nothing against any trumpet players out there. But if that's all you hear, it's, it's a little much. So it's important to have quiet areas as well. Um, areas that are blending together. Because that way, then the other areas look right. You know, they look, well, things are in balance that way. Okay. Just going to clean that brush out. That's the other thing. Try not to blend too much when you're working in an impressionist manner. Um, keep your color fresh. Keep your brushes clean. A little bit more sort of uh, advertising here. Um, I'm, I've also started rebuilding my website. And if anybody wants to go in, to andrewjuddart.com, um, you can see a whole bunch of new stuff there. Well, at least stuff that's presented in a new way, that way. Because um, I have lots of older pieces, and I've never really shown a lot of the older pieces. So if you're interested to check it out, always happy to have your comments, hear what you have to say. And uh, if there's something you like, I've sold a couple of paintings in the last week. So I'm really happy with that. When it happens, it's just great. It's nice to know people like what you're doing. Okay, I'm really going for the grays on this side over here. Um, going into these lighter grays, I want to pick up, I need sort of a focal area and I feel like it should be really in here. This is a an important area right here. So I'm going to get some good paint in here, some nice strong value change in the foreground right here. And I'm going to go into the shadow area here. A bit of green, a bit of red. There's the complement colors together and bring a bit of blue into that. And this is where I'm going to reach for something slightly darker. I'm going to go into that blue. And you can see that's darker than all the other colors I have up here because I want to punch this tree out a little more. It needs to have some, you know, base to it. It has to have something that pulls it away from the other trees a bit. And I go back and bring up some of the grays that I see in the tree beside it, right in here. Really mixing using texture and just, you know, blending where I need to and just throwing stuff in where I really have to, to punch things out a bit. I'm trying to keep it colorful. I haven't gone into really light lights. That's something that um, I noticed Monet did a lot was um, get these really light lights going. So I've got pure white here. I'm going to take in an even lighter blue. 
So I went to my light blue and just added that to the one that I pulled out. And just looking at this, I feel like it needs to pick up in a couple of areas here. And this is supposed to be the, the tree that's getting the most attention. So I'm going to chunk in even more. I'm going back to that white. It's getting pretty thick now. So thick and thin, that's another thing to think about. Um, if you're trying to create nice texture like that, um, you can do that with thick and thin as well. Just let those passages of thick paint do their job. But again, no pure white, I'm not using pure white. If any of you have any questions while doing this stuff, I'm happy to try and answer them. Some of you already know how to paint this way, I know. So um, it's just always kind of interesting to see people doing it. I love watching other people paint because you always learn something when you do that. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to go into, I'm going to try and I'm going to mix up a, a dark that, that is, goes below the, the gray scale that we've been working with. And again, if you look at Monet's paintings, you'll see he does that now and then. Um, I'm going to take white first though, because I don't want to get too dark. I'm going to go into the blue and I'm going to go into the red. So that's going to give me like a dark, a dark violet kind of color. And I went into the white first because the white pulls it and gives it a relationship. And that might be just enough accent to get my eye going to where I want it, which is somewhere in around here. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. And the other thing that I like to do, sometimes um, I've got an area that's dark like this in the painting later, afterwards, I'll go in on top of it when it's dry and just add a little bit more color into that. You know, maybe some blues or violets or something like that, just so that those shadows are not looking too heavy, because that can happen too. If you get too many darks going, it can look too heavy. And impressionist paintings don't typically look very heavy. So really try and restrain yourself from getting too many darks going, especially in the beginning. Use them as accents towards the end. I need to actually mix up a little bit more of, of blue. I'm just going to bring a blue up in here. And again, try and this is like a pure ultramarine blue now. And I'll let some of the other color mix into it so that it harmonizes a little. And sometimes when you get that pure color going, you see it's darker than the other colors. I have to be really careful with that. I'm going to bring a little bit of the red to it. Um, it's not as well it's pretty intense i have to go i have to be careful with it but i can go into these dark areas here with a bit of blue and that will start to punch these trees out a little more and still remains colorful that's the idea i'm really trying to resist getting into those super dark things that happen in a lot of paintings I, it's a danger for, you know, I do it often.
and you can really get some nice color going in shadows with an impressionist painting. Uh, when we're outside and we're looking around, we don't really see as much color in the shadows. So this is, in a way, it's kind of a, a what should we say, like a shorthand, almost, if that makes sense. Uh, a way of representing what we see uh, without it being really true. So just using a combination of warm and cool colors, trying to get a bit of a rhythm going across this way so we can feel that. We can use a couple of darker spots in underneath these trees so it feels like they're sitting on something right now. They don't feel like sitting on the ground. Okay. Now I can definitely afford to bring up more color in the foreground. So I'm going to go into some of these rich reds again. Um, and just punch those in. So this is gonna help us find our way in the painting. There's a bit of a path that takes us in to some of these lighter colors, the pinks that happen. Again, this is super loose right now. Putting some of these colors against the dark ones, they, that really punches things up too. You know, maybe there's a couple of leaves or something here. A little bit of light would find their way through. And I'm going to go into a very light pink color. Here. And again, that's a very limited palette. I'm only using three primary colors here. Ultramarine blue, cadmium red, and cadmium yellow to create all the colors that we're seeing here. The greens that are in behind were created, you know, from the same palette actually, um, but they're dry and I'm going over the dry paint. And some of that is very transparent color. So it's okay to leave that transparency. And I grab some of the yellow and get that down in the, the ground as well. Why not? And because there's light, wherever there's light, there's also areas that have shadow and, and are you know, you have some dark things happening as well. So I can bring in a little more detail here and there just to give a sense of texture on the ground. Um, the trees are going this way and the ground's kind of turning this way. So I want to accent that idea if I can. Push that idea. A painting should have an idea, like where are we going with this? Sometimes it's a, just an exploration in the beginning. You're not really sure where you're going. It's nice to have an idea, but these things evolve and you can start to feel your way in the painting and still, until it starts to have some kind of dimension, some kind of depth to it. And take it getting there. Like, you know, um, we're an hour into this already. Can't even believe it's gone that fast. But, you know, within an hour and a half, two hours, it's amazing how much ground you can cover. No pun intended. Um, when you're just trying to get the feeling for it to work. One of the things I have to be careful with, because my background as an illustrator can get in the way, 
is get too you know precious too pretty about it so you know when i see some of these marks here that are just like so obvious i, I need to kill those sometimes you know just you rely on little tricks that worked for you in the past you shouldn't really rely on them all the time that's just not a good thing because after a while well uh, you start painting like what's the guy who's mr painter of light i can't remember his name there we go Just going to pull a little bit of detail into a couple of spots. Um, right now, my eye is trying to get out of everything because of, it's all light down here. And there's a, too much information, too much contrast going on. So I really want to think about bringing more information in excitement to the center of the painting. And I can do that by just rubbing, you know, some color here. And this is one of those things where, you know, where, like, do I take that down and bring this up? Maybe that's the way, maybe I have to do both. Maybe I have to knock that down so it's less important and let this area here come up more. I'm going to bring some of those yellows in. And one of the things I love about the Impressionist's work is that, you know, they have colors going over top of colors that's broken, and it's not, it's just the sense of light that they could get by playing with all kinds of different colors in the light and a little bit in the shadow, but more so in the light. I can bring some blues into that even. Now I've got all of those light colors that are happening in the lit areas. It's a lot more exciting that way. Andrew, great question. Um, so I find pre-mixing all of my colors ahead of time really makes a big difference. I try to keep my brush as clean as I can. And I also really like to use a palette knife to put color down with because it puts nice clean color down. Um, yeah, Andrew's asked, how do you maintain the purity of the color um, and not get too muddy? And muddy is just when you get, you know, too many colors fighting with each other and beside each other um, and they're not harmonizing. So um, it, it's a challenge. It's a constant challenge. It's, it's not one that goes away. Um, but you also do have to have some grays because if you don't have grays and it's just all color, then it looks almost sickeningly sweet, you know? So that's, there's a balance between those two things somehow. Um, if you don't have grays that are working and grays are just really all your colors mixed together. But when you do that, like I'm just mixing all of these violet all these blues and this white and, and red and blue here together and putting those in your grays can still help push the colors that you see that are pure into the right place so um you you do need your grays you really do uh and grays are not muddy if they're harmonized so harmony just means having a if you work with a very limited palette which can be anything from, you know, three primaries or less. Um, if you have less than three primaries, that can also be very beautiful. You know, just a, a red and a blue, for example, or a, a yellow and a, um, uh, a yellow and a, a, um, a red. Like if you want to keep it sort of towards the orange side, for example, you can do that as well. Um, so I brought a lot of shadow into here. This is like a violet um, area now that's kind of holding, but the problem is it's not broken up enough now. Um, it Maybe if there's a sense of light hitting, but I want to pick up on that idea a little more. Um, I'm squinting at it now and trying to imagine what light might be coming in. Um, it carries out over here a little 
in is a combination of warm and cool colors. You don't want to have your palette knife or your brush create too many of exactly the same shapes. And yet you still want to maintain some kind of rhythm. So this is really a, a dance, you know, back and forth, trying to make sense of the shapes that you've got down there and trust yourself. Believe that you can, you can make that work. Uh, if it doesn't work, you just get rid of it. You just wipe it out and do it again or paint over it. That's okay too. <clears throat> uh, this here to me looks a little contrived. So I'm just going to scrape some of that away. And that's the other thing, you know, let the textures that are happening underneath work for you. That's one of the reasons why I really like painting over texture, because it gives you a chance of making things look a little bit more natural. The brush, the brush to me is a bit of a dangerous tool because, um, you know, I, I like work with it, but it leaves very predictable marks. And so when you start getting into a palette knife um, or other uh, tools, then you end up with shapes that you don't put down with a brush. It's less about the brushwork and more about um, what something looks like in nature, if that makes any sense. Because uh, nature is all broken um, and, and, you know, gnarly. And, um, we want to imitate nature in the best way we can. And so because we tend to like to organize things a lot, um, we become a little more graphic than we need to be. So, I'm just going to drop some color in here. I feel like this area over here needs to be a little bit uh, darker and again, a little more neutral. So I'm just cleaning my brush out again. I'm going to use that big fat brush that I like to get a little more depth back there and take that more into shadow over here. I like when those kind of things happen quite accidentally. And when something happens accidentally that you like, just leave it alone. Just put the brush down, pull it up, let it do its work. Um, break the rhythm. So right now I have a lot of trees that have the same importance. I'm going to get rid of a tree here. I need to get rid of a tree because it's just getting too much attention. This one here, I'm just going to get rid of it. And now we have a pattern that's more interesting. I try sometimes to imagine what some like someone like Monet must have been looking at and thinking about when he was painting because he captured things with such a looseness. Um, the way that he painted. Um, and I understand in his later years, his eyesight was very poor. So maybe that helps because it's when your eyesight's poor, it's like, well, you're squinting all the time, right? We really need to learn to squint, like really close your eyes down so that you're looking at just the most important elements of a painting. Really, really simplify things as much as possible. I want to take those trees back more. Right now, they're getting as much attention as these trees here. So the only way I can do that is to bring the value down and maybe use, you know, cooler colors. So I'm going to go in with blue that I mixed up ahead of time, and I just want to knock those down. get rid of some of all that, these textures that are just getting way too much attention. 
let it be windblown, you know? That makes any sense. It feels like these trees, you know, they've they've had their they've had their windy days. It's a bit of Bob Ross talk there. <laughs> yeah. Happy little trees. I need to have something, some kind of other branch going on here. Um, I notice in my original reference, there are some shapes that come through the trees as well. And I think it's important to get those working. So um, I'm going to grab a, my palette knife and let's just see if I can get a couple of shapes coming out of here that look interesting. And if it doesn't work, it's just a matter of doing it over. That's all. I really want to get the feeling of, the, of, of what's happening in this scene. I'm going to grab some white and just bring a tiny touch of violet into, into it and see if I can't bring a branch up in here. It's funny, I kind of blocked her entry into there, but it's okay. I'm seeing it in the reference, so it's the kind of thing that a photograph will give you information that you wouldn't necessarily paint in on your own because, you know, you think, well, I want to have a nice clean entry point into this somehow. But nature has its own way, so. I do need some more darks in the foreground um, in this area here. I feel like I could use some, so I'm just going to grab, uh, again, a bit of that red pick up a little bit of the blue that I have. And you can see now I'm getting into these darker values. I have to be really careful. Bring in the blue. Don't go too dark. That's too dark. No, I'm actually starting to have fun. Now, I have to be careful. Look how dark that went. I have to be really careful that I don't get too crazy with these darks. The trees themselves have a few little gnarly bits in them. So, um, they have these textures that are inside them. Old branches that have broken away, that kind of thing. So those small little details sometimes are all you need to do, uh, put in to pick it up a little. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? It's not too bad time-wise. If I put you to sleep, that's good, because, you know, you can replay this and put yourself to sleep again. <laughs> I used to listen to Bob Ross years ago, and that would put me to sleep. This very gentle voice. getting lots of violets going in behind there now that the green and violet is really fun together 
I like the way it looks. And I've got little highlights that aren't making sense here. So I'm just going to softly soft, soften those down, knock them back. I still want to have a sense of light and shadow, even though in this photograph, there isn't a whole lot of that going on. Um, I still want to get a feeling that, you know, one side is lighter than the other. almost like it's kind of front lit side lit you know maybe the lights coming from this side more oh that's gone really fuzzy there okay my camera's getting tired just a few little accents here Again, I'm, I'm running into the dangerous area of not being impressionistic enough, honestly. Um, I don't know if I've kept my, my value range very pure. So I'm just going to look at my darks. Well, okay. You know what? I've done okay. I haven't gone that dark anywhere. So that's good. That's something you can do. You can just continue to check and see. You know, what are my darkest darks? Well... I've gone a little bit darker than this light one here, and it's somewhere in around there. So I haven't gone right into my darkest areas. That's that's a good thing, because I really don't want to do that. It takes all the the light and light of the painting. I'm gonna go and soften some of this stuff down again. Some shapes together. And keep your shape simple. There's lots of texture, but keep your shapes uh, simple. Hi, Rita. Nice to see you. Thanks for showing. It's it's one of the things about um, um, doing these uh, live stream things is that you can watch them later on. So it doesn't matter if you're a little later. Not a problem. Just to appreciate when people show. It's great. Thank you. Now, I still feel that the top of these trees are getting too much attention. Um, all the way through here, I, I really want to bring the eye more into this area. That's the area of interest. So, I'm going to make a glaze and see if I can run it over some of these thicker textures. I'm going to bring in a glaze of blue, uh, pure ultramarine blue. Um, so I'm just mixing it on my other palette over here because it's just easier to do a glaze. A glaze is a very drippy thing. So I want to mix it on a flat surface so it's not running down like that was doing right there. And I'm just going to take a blue. Blue is one of those colors that makes things recede. And with this big wide brush, I have to be gentle when I do this. I just want to knock things down. I want to knock these colors down in behind here. Pull them together a bit so they're less important. And keep the eye coming to this area. And again, when you're using glaze, you have to go easy with uh, the brush. Keep cleaning. Going back into your glaze. Um, cleaning your brush out because you're picking color up under that's underneath. This is wet color underneath. So I have to be really careful. When I do this, that I don't make it too mucky, too muddy. I'm going to knock that down. That whole area, I'm going to soften down. Now, this isn't truly, in some ways, an impressionist way of working. Um, because they would do this with more broken color. Um, Less glazing for sure. 
but you know what we can do what we want to we're modern painters right so we can do what we want to if those guys did it their way we can do it our way I love what they did but why not do it our way try different things that that work for us right The further back it goes, the softer it gets. Picking up a couple of lights here and there, but I don't want too much of that. I want to really keep this simple. Hi, Nora. Welcome. Nice to see you. Thanks for dropping by. When you're putting a glaze in, you can get lots of detail too. It doesn't mean you can't. But again, I want to be careful how dark I go when I do this. Now I'm trying to simplify areas. So there's lots of color going on in there. It's probably hard for you to see this online. I'll post this later because um, you'll see a lot more color that way than what you're seeing on your screen and there's lots of subtle stuff happening when you start putting a glaze like this it starts to harmonize the colors that are in underneath and you have all these subtle variations that happen in between as the blue carries over the other colors underneath I want to lighten the edges as I come towards the outside edges of the painting just a little because that gives a sense of peripheral. Um, and the peripheral is just this idea that things go out of focus a bit. So if you have really hard edges up against the side of your paintings, that can really take the viewer's eye out of the painting a little too much. So try and keep an area of interest, try and keep a focal point in mind as much as you can. You know, this is starting to look and feel more like a focal area now. I'm happier with the line. Um, I just want to make sure that I don't take away from it now by getting too much information in other areas. So just keep that in mind as you're painting. Broken color, softer edges towards the outside of your painting. See, it's fairly soft all the way through the painting, all the way along the edges. Sometimes I just use my finger like this to, you know, wipe it down a, a little to try and keep that softness happening on the other side. We see this way. That's, when I talk about peripheral vision, it's, it's how we see. We, we don't see everything in focus unless we're looking specifically at an area. We don't see it in focus. So. Hi, Christian. Nice to see you. Um, okay, um, now I'm, I'm going to just step back for a second here and look at this and see what I need to do. I find this to be like a just a giant blob right here. It doesn't have much shape to it. You know, maybe there's a bit of light hitting here, but what I really want to do is create a more interesting shape because everything that we're looking at um, is a shape with a relationship to other shapes. I'm, I'm pretty okay with what happened here. I think I could soften a few things down just to, you know, have nicer transitions. Um, but generally speaking, I'm, uh, this area is working not too badly. But this here, I feel, is just a little too much. I either need more of that somewhere else or less of that. So I'm going to go in and with my palette knife because I can. It's just wet paint. I'm going to pull some of that away and just try and simplify this area a little. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, another, uh, well, you know, I'm going to put some green into that. I'm just curious to see what that will look like. If I like it, I can just paint over it. And while I do that, I can bring some blues into that as well. 
So there's a sense of shadow going here, and that creates a little bit more interest against those pinks and red, red kind of colors there. And that's kind of okay. Maybe I need to put a little more down in these areas too. So our eye is drawn up in through here. It's almost like an arrow, if I can say it that way. Going to soften that down. You know, one of the questions earlier from Andrew was, you know, how do you avoid muddy color? Well, here's the case where I'm getting into muddy color. There's no question. It, it, it's I'm graying it down, but it still has color in it, um, and I can bring color back into it by going back to my pure colors, it's like this sort of thing, if I want to, and create. More intrigue, more trust in the shadow areas. Letting the palette knife do some of that work. I'm going to go into the green. I mean, the screen is up in there, but why not pick it up down in here in places? So there's some texture, there's something that's taking us into the painting here, and then we got away from all that sort of pink that was going on. A little too much of it, frankly. Um, okay, I feel like I could use again. I want to create these nice focal areas here. I want to keep coming back to this focal area um, because I feel that it needs punching up even more. So, this is a case where I've got my palette knife out. These sharper edges, our eyes are drawn to sharper edges, edges as well, by the way. And that starts to have more interest. Okay. I like how some of the blues have come up in behind there. I want to accent that a little. I want to get a sense of light coming through this forest now. Let's see if we can do that. This is where I'm really getting away from the reference and I'm trying to create a little bit more interest in the area that's behind that's a little bit dull right now. There has to be some ground. <laughs> Thanks, Pearl. Um, I don't know if it's bravery. I think it's just sometimes stupid, but you know, I just like to try things. If it works, great. And if it doesn't, then you just get rid of it because it's just paint, right? Um, that's all it is, it's just paint. I'm gonna intensify some of the colors that are happening into this area here. The intense colors happen in the transition of light into shadow, typically. So you can put more intense color on the edge of your lights. That's something you'll see a lot in the Impressionist works, by the way. They'll really intensify colors as they start to go into the shadows. Um, I haven't introduced this color here at all yet. So I'm kind of curious to see what this is going to look like. This is like, um, it's it's a yellow, um, and I haven't put it anywhere. So I'm kind of curious. Really, I should keep it in the focal area. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's kind of nice. That brings that tree out a little bit. Maybe there's a bit here too. And just because you can, you can put a bit of pink in there beside it. Again, because the values are all similar to each other, if you keep them in the right place, then you can start putting any old color you want to in these things. 
I can put some pinks into these blues to have more life. And I can put some of the blue violet color. I'm do that. I'm going to mix up another violet over here. Uh, I need a little bit darker blue. And that can go to areas like back in here. So uh, I'm going to kill some darks that I have right there. Just a little more color, that's all. Now I'm going to go into that color, and maybe it's because it's there, it's going to be in a couple of other spots here. And the danger is getting too busy, right? I'm starting to see now. Um, when I look at these light patterns, I got one going back here, and then I thought, oh, isn't that clever? So I'm just going to put more. Well, I'm going to get rid of it now because really it's just too much. One area of light back there, that's enough. And maybe even that's too much. I don't know. That's okay. As you can see, you know, a painting is an evolution, right? You, you, you go with what feels right and looks right for you. It's no one else's painting. It's yours. So you, you get to play God. This is where you get to be, to do what you want to do. And you can look at it later and say, you know, I, I don't like it. It doesn't work or whatever. Um, every time you do a painting, you learn from that painting. That's the idea. Um, so you... You, you want to keep trying different things all the time. Don't be afraid to experiment. Don't get too safe with your work. You know, we get safe when we think, oh, someone else will like it and they won't like it. Or, you know, it won't get stuck on the fridge. <laughs> like when we were kids. Um, don't get too safe with your paintings. Don't get too precious. This could have been done in a much bolder, looser way. Like I'm already fussing here a little, honestly. So this could have been done with much bigger, bolder strokes. All these little bits and pieces. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, impressionist painting. And you see them doing all these little bits and spots all over the place, and that's great. But the truth of the matter is that, um, that was their particular way. And if you start copying or imitating another artist too much, you have to be careful with that because that's someone else's way. And it may, well, it's not your way, okay? Your way is going to be different. Maybe you're influenced by artist works. That's okay. Um, and it's fun to try and paint the way other people do just for fun. Um, but, you know, make it your own. Like, just play, make it your own, have fun. And you'll find that it's more exciting that way. And there's more pleasure in it. And if anyone comes up to you and says, oh, it looks just like a movie, except it's not, you say, well, that's because I painted it, you know? And I don't paint like Monet. I paint like me. No one could do me better than Monet, and no one can do you better than you. I don't think. All right. Well, I'm kind of drawing close to the end on this. I'm just going to jam in a couple of spots here. I want to get some of those reds coming down into this foreground area more, kind of like how that was going sort of weird having a red ground like that, but what the heck, you know? Um, put a couple more lights in near the focal area. Make them strong. You know, do it like you mean it. Um, and then this whole thing starts to come alive. Now I'm starting to put some really clean, pure color in. When I say pure, the colors that I pre-mixed Typically, when we're painting, one of the things that happens is 
we end up muddying up our whole palate, right? Like it gets pretty all over the place. Um, and with those, you know, we mix our brush into those colors and then everything starts getting muddy and mucky towards the end. But if you have some nice fresh color um, on your palette that you can use near the end, this is a great way to work with pre-mix your colors like this. And in the end, this is okay. I'm not unhappy with it. I think it's it, there are things that are working, things that are not working. I may fiddle with this a little more, but I'm pretty much to the point where I need to step back from it, uh, look at it, say, you know, well, what else do I need to do to make this work better, if if uh, possible, you know, it's um. There's always something that can make it better. So I'm going to come back to you. Um, let me just do this. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing. Um, really do appreciate uh, that you've come along today. Um, Andrew, uh, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying doing this. I'm painting anyhow. Um, and as I sort of try and explain what I'm doing and talk through this and give myself exercises. Um, it helped me to learn something about painting too, because I have to articulate what it is that I'm, I'm trying to do. And um, it, it's a process that, that stays with you if you have to put it into words, I think. Um, it stays with you a little better, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying doing it. It's, it's a lot of work to actually think about what to do and I start thinking about it as soon as I finish this I start thinking about next week and there's lots of other stuff going on but I, I do hope that you know this is something that you're that you can get something from and that um, there's some tips and and so on that help you with your painting other people have been very generous to show me their way of painting and uh, what they do and and um, there's lots to learn um, again, um, check out the Toronto Art, Outdoor Art Fair online, T-O-A-F, if you punch that into Google. There's lots of great art there by other artists, um, and I happen to be in that show this year. Again, it's their 60th uh, anniversary, which is amazing. Um, so it's worth checking that out. And um, please uh, feel free to text or email me or whatever. Check out my new website. Uh, which I've got up and running. It's andrewjuddart.com. Uh, com, and um, uh, hopefully we'll see you back here next week. Thanks again for showing. Sorry about the sound issues I had. I really tried to sort this out, and I'm hoping that the sound isn't brutal. Anyhow, um, be well, stay safe, enjoy the good weather if you're having it wherever you are, wherever you're from, and. Um, um, uh, you know, be well and happy painting. All right. Take it easy. See you next time. See you next Friday. Bye-bye.